New York is known for many things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But what happens when a combination of insatiable lust, psychopathic tendencies, and an obsession with detective shows is dropped into a city of endless possibilities? This is the story of Richard Cottingham. With about 100 suspected murderers and only a few victims identified to date, there aren't many who come close to the prowess of this man. His very existence is proof of just how blind we can be to the things going on around us if they aren't loud enough to catch our attention. It's also a testament to how the system, put in place to safeguard the life and interest of the public, struggled to keep up with even the most average criminal at the time. As always, welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we'll be diving into the case of Richard Cottingham, the big bad wolf of Times Square, who terrorized the sleepless city of Manhattan and New Jersey, leaving multiple dismembered bodies in his wake. Dubbed the Torso Killer, the Times Square Torso Ripper, or simply the Times Square Killer, Cottingham had quite the reputation in the late 1900s. Without further ado, let's delve into the dark, twisted history of one of the most successful serial predators to make his mark in New York. Richard Cottingham was born in 1946 in the Bronx, New York, before moving with his family to New Jersey after he turned 12. He was the oldest of three kids, born to a homemaker mother and a father who worked for an insurance company. Richard was in the seventh grade when his family relocated to New Jersey, and he was slow to make friends both in the new school and neighborhood. He also couldn't find any solace in sports because his eyesight was terrible. It wasn't until high school that he was allowed into the track team. But even then, he barely fit in and he spent the bulk of his time alone. Upon graduation, Richard got a job in the same company as his father. While taking computer classes, he served as the company's computer operator. When Richard turned 20, he got the chance to move on from his father's work. Blue Cross Blue Shield employed him as a computer operator. This would appear to be the turning point in his life because after an entire lifetime of little to no signs of homicidal thoughts, he murdered a fellow resident of his town just a year after landing the new job. Richard was your typical nice guy in the beginning. He was raised in a Catholic family and seemed to be having a great time until they moved to Rivervale in New Jersey. Richard seemed hardest hit by the change in environment, and he became a loner soon afterward. His friendships were few and far between, and he preferred to stay at home and keep to himself. It was at this point that he made the biggest and most defining discovery of his teenage years, pornography. Richard surfed long enough to arrive at the bondage section. It seemed to have unlocked a dark part of his psychology because he became obsessed with bondage pornography. Now, we can't knock anyone for preference and kinks, of course, but with the correlation with his obsession and his soon-to-be non-consensual sex crimes are horrifying. To everyone around him, Richard looked like he was doing well for himself. Things couldn't be better and he was making significant strides after school. With good grades, a solid gig upon graduation, early marriage, and a few children, there was nothing left to desire or be desired in life. Or was there now? Underneath Richard's warm, overachieving exterior was a cold, sad, predatory lunatic lurking in the shadows. This beast within Richard surfaced momentarily in 1968 when he murdered his first victim, Nancy Vogel. The mother of two lived in the same neighborhood as Richard, Little Fairy, and was on her way to bingo when she made a last minute stop at the mall. There, she met her end at the hands of her unneighborly neighbor, who strangled, stripped, and abandoned her lifeless body in the car. Nancy's case was a head scratcher for the police, who couldn't produce any suspects or leads. The case started to collect dust over time until it was turned cold and was forgotten. 
Richard turned to petty crimes the next year when he was caught for drunk driving through the city. Three years down the line, he tried to shoplift from a store but was caught. It made no sense why Richard tried to steal or what he intended to take. There was no history of him purchasing anything in particular, and it was uncertain if he was short on money, which would have been strange considering his steady employment. All he got was small jail time and a fine. Perhaps deciding that petty crimes were not his thing, Richard moved back to the big leagues. In 1973, a woman called the cops on him, and he was taken away. He was charged with robbery, sodomy, and sexual assault. But the judicial system was again swift to dismiss the case. Time went by and Richard became as deranged as they come. He made the trip to New York every day for his work, but didn't return home all the time. Sometimes the crazy took over. He stayed in the city to let loose. He stalked multiple bars in Manhattan, biding his time and watching for poor, unsuspecting women trying to relax after a tough day. Richard had specific tastes, and once he found women that fit the bill, he swung into action. He played the old trick of drugging their drinks before moving them to a motel to enact his sexual fantasies, which took the form of torturing his victims for hours. In 1974, a year after his previous court case, Richard was taken to court again twice. First, he was charged with robbery and unlawful imprisonment, while the second case cited sodomy and robbery. By now, you'd think his other cases would serve as precedents to open the eyes of the court to a disturbing pattern. But you'd be wrong. Richard's sight was perfect in comparison to the criminal justice system because both cases were dismissed. While Richard seemed to avoid murdering women in 1978, he didn't exactly stay crime-free. He went on a torture streak on two women, one of whom was pregnant. He may have caused more havoc than that, but only this much is known for now. By 1979, Richard decided he'd given the city enough time to recover from his murders. So he kidnapped Helen Sykes, a teenage sex worker from Times Square. She turned up dead after several days with her throat slit deeply enough to almost sever her head. Her legs had also been mutilated. It was around this time his wife filed for divorce, claiming that Richard was mentally cruel, unsupportive, and had abandoned his family. And what do you know? It was never completed. Cottingham preferred his targets petite and blonde, toward their mid-twenties and mostly sex workers. He had a way of soliciting them that was surprisingly successful just before he distracted them enough to spike their drinks. His go-to drug was Tuanol, which was commonly used for spiking drinks before roofies entered the scene. He usually found his victims at bars before moving them to secluded locations, preferably a motel. There, Richard bound his victims and gagged them with duct tape. Having secured them in place, he had his way with strangling victims before proceeding to torture them. His go-to torture techniques were scratching or biting hard on their nipples and making them refer to him as master. Other times, he cut around the breasts and threatened them with a toy gun. To spice up the ordeal, he sometimes left the gun within reach of the victim to give them a false sense of hope. And when they grabbed it and pulled the trigger, they'd find it was fake. The deranged show ended with stabbings and stranglings with a ligature. With his DNA all over the scene, you'd think this guy would be an easy catch, but Richard knew a thing or two about forensics and did his best to frustrate the authorities. First, he made it difficult to identify his victims because he made souvenirs of their mutilated hands and heads. He also took their personal effects like jewelry and the likes as some sort of sick trophy to remember them by. Richard took his time to clear the crime scene and dispose of bodies in secluded locations. Other times, he just set the room on fire and made a run for it. Between 1967 and 1989, there are nine known cases of murder against Richard, with another four on the grounds of attempted murder. 
On his own, he claimed to have killed up to 100 people. His first named victim was Marilyn Carr. A 26-year-old nurse Richard abducted from her apartment parking lot and took her to a motel where she was subsequently tortured and murdered. In the year that followed, he adopted a new alias for approaching women. He introduced himself to a certain Karen Schilt as John Schaefer before drugging her drink at the bar and taking her to an undisclosed location. There, he took sexual advantage of her and dumped her in the sewers next to an apartment complex. Luckily enough for Karen, she was discovered by hotel staff. Upon recovering, she couldn't remember the details of the assault and the case was all but dead until Richard was apprehended. In October of the same year, he met Susan Geiger, whom he also drugged and played out his sexual fantasies. He tried to murder her, but she got away. His biggest known night of crime was in December of 1979, when he accosted two sex workers and drove them to the Travel Lodge Motor Inn in New York. Throughout the night, he tortured and killed the duo before mutilating their bodies. He severed their hands and heads for his trophy cabinet and started a fire to burn the bodies and the room. Richard made his escape before staff discovered smoke seeping through the door. After putting out the fire, only one of the victims could be identified, Dida Godzari. The other victim remains unknown, but she was estimated to be a teenager. By the turn of the new year, Richard doubled down on his attacks. He assaulted four women within three weeks. His first victim was Valerie Ann Street, whom he murdered and burned in a hotel room. Next was Pamela Winesfield, who was fortunate enough to survive. The third victim was Ann Rayner, whose charred body was found in Manhattan South in a hotel room. But rather than taking her hands and head as usual, he took her breasts. Richard Cottingham's luck ran out in 1989 when he solicited Leslie Ann O'Dell, an 18-year-old sex worker who sold her trade on Lexington Avenue and 25th Street. She agreed to $100 for some action, and the duo checked into a room at Hasbrook Heights Quality Inn. Interestingly enough, Richard was a repeat customer at the inn, and he had picked a room in which he had previously mutilated and murdered a victim. What could go wrong? Leslie noted that he was nice and courteous, and the night was off to a great start. Ever the gentleman, he offered her a massage, and she agreed. Having rolled over onto her stomach, Richard straddled her back and produced a knife. He pressed the cold, hard steel against her throat, rendering her helpless. The subdued Leslie was promptly handcuffed as the torture session began. He beat, bit, and played out his sexual fantasies on her, all the while insisting, you have to take it. The other girls did. You have to take it too. You're a whore and you have to be punished. Although she'd been gagged, Odell's cry grew loud enough to attract external attention. Richard had been biting down on one of her nipples. He almost tore it free. The motel staff, who had already seen a murder scene some days back, didn't hesitate to bring in the police. They marched in on the room and demanded Richard open the door. The arriving officers arrested Cottingham in the hallway of the motel with personal effects like two slave collars, handcuffs, replica pistols, a leather gag, several prescription pills, and a switchblade. While he was being interrogated, Richard claimed that his actions were consensual and he'd paid Leslie $180 for sex. He was kept for further investigations when the pattern of his murder started to come to light. First, Valerie Ann Street's crime scene turned up a fingerprint from a pair of handcuffs that matched Richard's. Next, the police raided his home and found tons of evidence incriminating him for multiple murders, like the key to Mary Ann Carr's house, Ann Rayner, and Dita Gonzalez's jewelry, and a pair of earrings and a koala bear belonging to Valerie Ann Street. His handwriting also matched several motel rooms he'd rented for earlier murders. His room and car trunk also turned up more personal effects of his many victims, some of which have yet to be identified. Cottingham was indicted in New Jersey for a host of charges, such as aggravated assault while armed, fellatio, sodomy, attempted murder, and possession of a controlled substance. 
The next year, Richard Cottingham was found guilty of 15 of the 20 charges against him. Over the next three years, he was tried for several other cases of attempted murder and murders. During this time, he's attempted to take his life twice in court to no avail. In the early 1980s, he was convicted for five murders. He pled guilty to Nancy Vogel's murder in 2010, for which he received a 100-year sentence. And as recently as 2021, he was found guilty of abducting, taking advantage of, and drowning teenage girls Mary Ann Pryor and Laureen Mary Kelly in 1974. For prosecution immunity, Richard also confessed to murdering three women. Denise Falaska from Kloster, Irene Blaze from Bogota, and Jacqueline Harp from Midland Park between 1968 and 1969. Cottingham has been tried several times and found guilty all through. There is a staggering amount of evidence against him, ranging from receipts he wrote and signed, which link him to the only recovered fingerprint and hotel history. There are also the testimonies of three survivors. Richard faces multiple trials for his crimes in both New York City and New Jersey. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Richard Cottingham, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.